Today we are going to talk about the Supremes. Not Diana Ross's wonderful, magical, musical group, but the nine justices that make up the Supreme Court. We'll talk a little bit about the history, why they're even there, why do they exist, what cases do they even get to hear, and what we can do about the terrible decisions that have been handed down in the last few weeks. So stay with us till the end of the video, but first, this is Latina Literati. The Supreme Court is first mentioned in Article 3, Section 1 of the Constitution, and that is where the Supreme Court is literally written into existence by the framers of the Constitution. Then there is a Judiciary Act of 1789. That is the act by Congress that establishes the Supreme Court. And the original Supreme Court had six justices. But we're only talking about the original 13 states. So there were three areas. I'm assuming it was North, Middle, and South. And the justices had to serve the circuit courts, which are the courts before the Supreme Court. And they also had to meet once a year as part of the Supreme Court. This is just a tidbit of history, just a bird's eye view of the process of how we got to where we are today. Many of the justices had other jobs. Some of them ran for office. Some of them didn't even want to be justices. They were kind of forced into it by George Washington. So it's really interesting how these first justices had kind of had to be corralled into doing their work. And there was a lot of what today we would call conflict. You know, imagine running for office while you're sitting on the Supreme Court. Imagine running other businesses while you're on the Supreme Court. Imagine literally exiting to another area of the country because you don't want to serve. So it's uh, quite humorous, the first group of justices that serve on the Supreme Court. For the first 80 years of the U.S. Supreme Court, there were only six justices. Congress, as a gift to U.S. Ulysses S. Grant, when he becomes president, raises the number to nine. So really interesting. They want him to be able to appoint justices that will back his reconstruction and the laws that are being passed to try and undo a lot of the Southern racist slavery policies that were in place. And so in order for the courts to back up the legislature, basically, the Congress says, okay, Grant, we'll give you three more justices and you can appoint them so that there'll be people who see things as you see them. So this is not new. This is definitely not a new concept where the numbers of the Supreme Court are changed and justices are then placed there to represent specific political persuasions. So how do the justices even get to hear cases? How do cases even get to the U.S. Supreme Court? You can spend years studying federal civil procedure, but I'm going to give you just a two-minute overview. Basically, it means someone can be an individual, can be a group, can be an entity like a corporation, says the government has violated the Constitution. Very simple, in a very simple way, that's what a case has to encompass for it to go all the way up. And so it's heard first by the federal district courts, and somebody wins and somebody loses. So one of the two, probably usually the loser, will then take it up to the circuit courts. The circuit courts then decide. They can say, we agree with the district court or we don't. And then usually whoever loses may want to take it up to the Supreme Court. About 10,000 cases are appealed to the Supreme Court. 10,000 cases. And they actually only hear about 60 to 70 cases a year. 
So that's why you, there may have been, I think there was a movie or something, the first Monday in October. And so the first Monday in October is when the justices meet and they decide which cases they're going to hear for that term. The rule that is applied is called the rule of four. If four of the justices believe that the case needs to be heard, and normally it means that there is what is called a split of authority. It means some courts say that the result is A, and other courts say that the result is B. And in order to bring some sort of common standard, then the court is going to take more interest in a case when you have different courts giving different decisions on the same issue. Again, really general uh, Civ Pro here, but it's important to have that background as we go forward and discuss what the justices are doing now. When you appeal to the Supreme Court, it's called a writ of certiorari. Don't you love Latin? <laughs> That's when the case is being appealed to the Supreme Court, if perchance it's one of the 60, more or less 70 that will be heard this year, then the hearing will proceed and more or less between October and April, the justices will hear arguments. And that's why decisions are handed down at this time of year, more or less in June before they leave for recess. And as you have heard in the news, there have been some really poor decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court because of the last three justices that were appointed. I refuse to use the name of the last occupier of the White House, but El Trompudo, basically, he appointed three judges, several of whom were not qualified by their peers. In other words, the American Bar Association and other professional groups either say that a judge is worthy of such an honor or it's not. And several of them, their own peer said they are not qualified. And so that just goes to show you the quality that we're talking about in terms of justice, in terms of experience, in terms of judicial demeanor, in terms of ethics, and in terms of really transparency and what the court means in our everyday lives. All of that is impacted by the quality of the judges that are chosen. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court justices police themselves. So what does that mean? They don't have a special code of ethics. And you can see by the news that several of them have been even unable to properly, truthfully fill out the financial disclosures required by the 1978 Ethics Act, where all judges need to talk about what conflicts may be present. And so specifically, Justice Alito, Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas have huge, huge conflicts. Imagine you're a judge and your spouse and yourselves are going to benefit from the outcome of the case. That's unheard of. I mean, that is just prima facie, baby level conflict. And so if there were any rules in place, then you would have to recuse yourself. You'd have to say, I can't partake in this particular case because I have a financial interest in it. And that's the way it should be. I'm going to give you an example of something that happened. And one of the reasons why we have the court that we have today, Justice Kennedy, who actually was a con law teacher, he was a constitutional law teacher at the law school I attended, his children were very close to the children of the last occupier of the White House. And so when he wanted an opportunity to appoint someone with very little experience, but who would tow his line, Justice Kennedy was talked into resigning from the court. As a result, then you had someone less qualified and who was basically going to tow that I'm going to call it a fascist line at the court level. So Justice Kennedy had not just his children as friends of the last occupier of the White House, but also his son was very involved in getting the last occupier of the White House huge amounts of loans from Deutsche Bank, most of which Deutsche Bank would have to write off. So again, there's a lot of financial impropriety going on here. I really believe that half the court should simply be forced to resign or face impeachment. And that leads me into the next part of the video. What can we do? What are the things that we, the people, do when justices behave in a manner that is not becoming of the office? 
that borders on at least ethics violations, let alone basic principles of fairness and judicial propriety, at least. In the over 100 justices that have served on the Supreme Court, there have been two cases where there were articles of impeachment considered. One was in 1804 against Samuel Chase. He was impeached by Congress, but then he was acquitted by the Senate. So he was able to keep his office. And the second justice that resigned in the face of impeachment in 1969 was Abe Fortas. Again, both of these impeachments were based on financial gain and impropriety, really specific, dead on exactly what we're seeing today financial gain from specific cases or having to do with people who are involved in matters that wouldn't be considered legal. So really, again, we have a history of this. We know what has to be done. And so there are several things that we can push our representatives to do. One is articles of impeachment. If someone has done something wrong, then the only way to remove a justice is to impeach them. Another way is to request their resignation so that they are not brought before the House and they don't have to answer articles of impeachment. And I think that's something that could that, that could and should be done with several of the justices as well. And of course, lastly, Congress could say, we're not going to have nine, we're going to have 12, and then appoint three women, because there are a whole lot of women that are not yet represented. We need women from Asian American backgrounds, and we need indigenous women on the court. We need more women on the court. And so if we could get three more justices, and they be women who look like us, then I feel like we have a chance to save this institution and to save the checks and balances that it's supposed to represent. And so I would love to hear what you think and see where you are on this issue. And now for my favorite part of the video, of course, is the book recommendations. The first book is called Nine Black Robes and it's by Joan Biskupic. <laughs> And she really delves in, because she has contacts on the inside, delves into the insular world of the justices. How do they make those decisions? And what is it that makes that world tick? You know, what are the clerks doing? And what are the clerks thinking? What happens in the process of hearing the arguments and then preparing the decisions? Really interesting aside, since 2017, there has been a huge rise, a huge spike in the use of what are called kind of secret decisions that aren't signed. Before that, it was really rare. And now they're using them more and more to just kind of get a decision out there without anybody taking responsibility and without any transparency. And that's really, really problematic. Nine Black Robes, it's a fabulous read, a lot of good information and highly recommend it. The second book is exactly on what I was just mentioning. It's called The Shadow Docket. And it's really worthwhile because it explains, you know, what is this mysterious kind of secret way that this highest court of the land can make these decisions and not sign them, have no transparency, no hearings. I mean, what is that about? Why is that even happening? And this is important. And you know that saying, if you're not angry, you're not paying attention. <laughs> It's a good book and it's worth a read if you want to delve more into that particular aspect of the court. The last book is called The Supermajority, How the Court is Dividing This Country. Again, interesting read, perspective on what happens when you can't trust the courts, when you know that they're not working towards the common good or even basic principles of law, that they're just following just raw partisan politics. What does that mean for the other branches of government? And what does it mean for the people that are subjected to these unjust rulings? What does that mean? And so this book really delves into that and I really recommend it. We love our local libraries. Always check to make sure that the books that we're recommending are available at your local library. They're a treasure. Our local libraries started in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin. And we also love our local booksellers. They are our neighbors, our friends, really important to support small business and to help them as we build a new economy. So if by chance you don't have a local library or your local bookseller doesn't have the books, we always include them in the description box below, available new and used on independent online bookselling sites. So we hope that that's of use to you as well.
We would love you to subscribe to Latina Literati. We want to know what it is that you're thinking, what it is that you'd like us to talk about. Thank you so much. Thank you.